Stephen Nicholas. Uh, I'm 30 years old, almost 31, as hard to believe as that is. Um, if I shaved, you never know it. Um, I am a data analyst uh, in the agriculture industry. Uh, don't ask me how I ended up there. It's not my, I got a degree in applied mathematics, so uh, definitely not where I thought I'd end up. Um, I'm one of nine kids. I'm the middle of nine kids, actually. And uh, at this point, I have a small little family. It's just uh, me and my girlfriend here in the house, and we have a little cat named Nellie, and uh, you might even hear her in the interview at some point, so. So the first time that I ever saw Magic Cards was actually playing Pokemon. Uh, I played as a child, uh, maybe six years old. Uh, the neighborhood, the neighbor kid, no, I guess maybe I was older than that maybe eight or nine. There was a kid that lived behind me in our apartment complex and we used to play Pokemon all the time. And uh, we were on Ming Avenue where the Toys R Us was. So we'd ride our bikes down on Saturday mornings and go play a little league and they'd give you little badges every time you won. And um, we had a ton of fun with that. Well, they ended the league. They announced that it was gonna be ending within a month. And I remember wandering around and there was this kid, Sam, and he was a lot older than us. He was probably a teenager. I guess he's like 10 years older than me. And uh, he was playing magic with one of his friends and never seen anything like it. And I just remember being really mesmerized by the symbols in the middle of the basic lands. Uh, he must have had, I think, like seventh edition basics. And the white on the sun from the plains and then the forest, it really stood out to me. And I was like, That's, that looks really cool. I have no idea what they're doing, but that looks interesting. And uh, shortly after Toys R Us closed, my friends and I were like, or, or after they stopped hosting Pokemon tournaments, the Toys, Toys R Us was still open, but we were like, what are we gonna do? And so I remember walking through a Target one day and there was a little seventh edition starter deck sitting at the end of, a, at the end of an aisle and I had enough money for it, I bought it. It came with like a, C, like a CD that I think showed you how to play the game that I never watched uh, and a rule book we never read, but it had a foil seventh edition thorn elemental and my friends and i played some games and we played really poorly and and honestly i just kind of i loved the game from there so as a kid once i picked up magic as a game um my older brother really glommed onto it uh, my older brother ryan is five years older than me and he really liked the flavor of the game the artwork he's a great artist so he loved to draw the cards and um and and it really captured his imagination also so he actually built us like a um i don't know a 5k box that was custom and had foam and all kinds of stuff in it velcro and and we used to store all of our cards in there we would st save up our change go buy some booster packs and and build decks and unfortunately for us we really started playing a lot through Mirrodin and Kamigawa which are not real popular for having lots of good cards and lots of interesting cards and unfortunately with Mirrodin when you only have so much money you end up with one copy of Platinum Angel and one copy of Sword of Fire and Ice and those cards end up in all your decks because they're colorless and so my brother and I played a lot of like hey I'm gonna you're gonna come by on Friday you know my dad will drop me off over there so I'm gonna build a deck. When you get here, you build a deck and we'll play some games Saturday or something like that. And so uh, we had to start house banning cards like Platinum Angel. You can't keep playing with that. Like, it's not fair, we only own one. And so we played a lot of Magic like that, especially during the school year. It gets so hot in Bakersfield that there's nothing else to do on the weekend. You don't wanna be out in the 100 degree heat or in the winter if it's raining or whatever. So we just had this box of cards that we'd slide out from under our bed and we'd open it up and we'd just build a deck today. And my brother might put some stipulations, like build a red green deck with no rares. And you know, he'll play like blue black and we'll, we'll battle it out for you know, the rest of the weekend or something. Um, but I did that from probably 12 to like 14 or 15. We had several years of, of just the kitchen table battles or playing in the floor in the living room.
played uh, at a few different stores um, previously. I'd played a little bit at Golden Glove, and I'd heard of Paladin's Game Castle. And um, the first major tournament that I had ever heard of, though, or I guess I wouldn't even call it a major tournament, it was the first time I ever heard of an organized tournament, and I needed a DCI number to play, um, was that Paladin used to hold a tournament at Stockdale High School uh, once a year. And I forget the name of the tournament, but they would hold it in the cafeteria. And this one was really big. First place, I believe, won a Mox Ruby. And they gave out a bunch of judge foils. This was right around the time, I believe Lorwyn was the newest standard set. And so Planeswalkers had just come out. And I remember there just being like a lot of buzz. And I was so excited to play. I actually convinced like four or five guys from my high school to come down and play who were every bit as casual as I was. They had no idea what, what this tournament was going to be like. And they brought just their random decks that they played with on the kitchen table um, and that we played with each other on lunch at the high school and, and whatever. So uh, this tournament, we were all so excited for. And unfortunately for them, I was the only one who did reasonably well. I actually finished seventh place, which was pretty awesome for somebody who kind of like mm, barely knew the rules and built my own deck out of some junk. Um, but I got to meet Roger there, and Roger was the judge. And, and I remember he got some chuckles because I was just a random kid and I beat some of the people who had been playing for a while at the store. And, and so he kind of, like, we tried to do some trading. I wanted some of his foils and he wasn't having it. But it was, uh, it, that was a good way to parlay into meeting some people to actually go play some real tournaments. Um, and, and the feeling of having done okay was enough for me to be pretty hooked. Lorwyn was released in October 2007 when I played that first tournament. Uh, I graduated high school in May of 2008 and I actually qualified for debate nationals which was going to happen over the summer. So the most recent set that came out was Shadowmoor and one of the guys on the bus, we, we split buses with East High School, and this guy named Carl, who we were actually debate rivals, ended up both qualifying for nationals. And on the bus, I see him flipping through the newest set guide of all the newest released cards. And, and I look over and, and like, hey, I, I used to play that game. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've played a few tournaments, but I haven't touched my cards basically since October, really. And he was like, oh, this game is awesome. And he really didn't know a ton about it, but he wanted to look up some new cards to buy for his deck. So he's flipping through his site guide. And so we get to Vegas and we're gonna be in Vegas for, a, I think a week for debate nationals. And we're 17 years old, nothing for us to do. So we decided to hitch a ride to the nearest game store I think it's on Boulder. I don't remember the game store, what it was, but um, we bought Lorwyn starter decks and some Shadowmoor booster packs and we sleeved some things up and we just played in, in our hotel room for a few days and we got back into town. We, we kept numbers and we started to travel around. We, we met up with some guys from Paladin's Game Castle and they told us that they were gonna travel down to LA to go play a tournament. And uh, I'll never forget, we actually took we got driven by his girlfriend's mom to, uh, I think LAX. And I think we had to take a bus from there to Anaheim. It was like a Disneyland bus or something. And it dropped us off on Harbor, which is the street the convention center's on where the tournament's gonna be played. And so we're, uh, we, we bus tripped it. I actually lost a deck box like on the public bus and, and we both went like one and three and we're not prepared to play against fairies. We just got annihilated. And, and the local guys, you know, the local like long timers just laughed at us. They told us we should have just went to Disneyland instead. We had such a fun tournament experience playing though um, that, that that was really the start of us playing all the time. And I started to play Magic any chance I got, I'd stay over at Carl's house and we would play till four o'clock in the morning and, and do this every night. And we started to play several PTQs in a row. And I don't think I finished better than maybe two and three, two and four uh, over the next four or five. We would go to San Diego and then Los Angeles and then Fresno and Sacramento. And we did really poorly everywhere we went, but it wasn't enough to stop us. The first tournament that I did even moderately well at, I actually spiked this tournament and 
we played a PTQ in Las Vegas. This was the back-to-back -back Vegas to Irvine. These were the last two tournament, the last two PTQs of this format for the season. I, I believe this is Lorwyn Block PTQs. Um, I absolutely loved Cryptic Command as soon as it was printed. I had a bag full of quarters and I bought four Cryptic Commands for sixty dollars and change. Uh, to finish out this deck and and once I was hooked I started foiling it out I still have a lot of them mole drifters shriek mom makeshift mannequin kitchen finks um, Cryptic command reflecting pool was just beautiful for some reason they misprinted the shadow more reflecting pool symbol So it had a planes symbol in the middle of the card. Um, I love the deck five color control uh, it actually won a Grand Prix I think right around this time. And so it kind of like steeled my resolve that this is the, the right deck to be playing. Um, and in Las Vegas, round one, I get paired against one of the guys in our car. And this tournament is, I would guess, probably in the neighborhood of 200 players. These PTQs were always huge. And uh, <clears throat> round one, I get paired against one of the guys in our car and he's playing mono red. And I should have lost this game, this match, but in game three, I draw all four copies of Ruined Halo. The two mana, double white, as it enters play, name a card, you get protection from the chosen card name. And so he plays turn one figure of destiny. I name that with my Ruined Halo on turn two. Then on turn three, I name his three drop Bogart Ram Gang. Then later in the game, I name his burn spell because I'm at two life, so I don't want to lose to to just like taking four from Flame Javelin. And then I draw the fourth one and I draw Cloud Thresher and it deals two damage to each player when it comes into play. So I end up having to rune Halo, my own Cloud Thresher, so I can cast it, but it's good enough that I kill him with it. And, uh, and I end up stealing a win there. And a few rounds later, I'm actually 4-0 and I get paired against Brian Kibler, who at this point, he's not back on the train yet. He's not Hall of Fame Pro Tour champion Brian Kibler yet. He's trying to grind his way to uh, uh, back onto the Pro Tour, Brian Kibler. And he, I believe he's been top eighting PTQs left and right. He just can't, it's been elusive to actually win one. And so we get paired in round five, I think both at 4-0 and I end up beating him. He's on Doran, and uh, Archon of Justice was really good in that matchup, and so I end up beating him to death with a couple of Archon of Justices. I think I dropped pretty well. I was nowhere near as good as he was, and, uh, and I end up stealing the match, and I go on to top eight this PTQ, and uh, I get my best matchup. My best matchup is the Kithkin deck, in the top eight round and game one he draws four cloud threshers and i still win i just mop it up with a bunch of fire spouts and hallowed burials and and i end up winning and game two um he's on the play and he just rolls me over and game three i mulligan end up having to keep a hand that has like four lands two spells and i completely flood out and i get beat and i remember that was the first real big like magic heartbreak that was like the bad beats was I don't even know if I'm any good at this game or not, but I have a real chance to win this tournament knowing how the pairings are going. I get my best matchup in the first round. If I win, there are two more Kithkin decks, so I have a possibility to just roll my way to the finals. And, uh, and I put a lot of time playtesting into, like just playing in general to get better. And so that was the first real, like, real high of being there and having people congratulate, like you top aided, you did it, you broke the Bakersfield curse and then losing in the first round anyway. So um, that was the first real taste of like what, it, what it's like to, to win and then also what it's like to, to lose when, when you kind of get your own hopes up. my stride as a competitive magic player around the time that cons of tarkir came out uh, i i didn't have a lot of fantastic finishes before this i had some ptq top eights back when they were still ptqs but nothing really ever notable i had top eighted an scg open before 
got to play an Invitational, but it wasn't until Cons of Tarkir came out that I really started to hit my stride and really started to win all the time. And with, with Cons of Tarkir Standard, I played a lot of Mantis Rider, a lot of Jace Vryn's Prodigy. I really enjoyed those the heck out of those two cards. I played a lot of the Jeskai Tokens archetype with Jeskai Ascendancy, and a lot of just the Jeskai Aggro archetype with, with Goblin Rabble Master, Lightning Strike. Um, Disdainful Stroke changed the world. That card was phenomenal. And at this point, I believe within a year span, I had top Ford an SCG regionals. I won an SCG regionals. I top aided another regional tournament. I top aided, I think, three PPTQs in a row between Fresno and, and Los Angeles, and all with real, more, more or less the same exact 75. And I had gotten laid off from a job at this point, and so I had six months where I was gonna go, I was going back to school and I was gonna figure out, you know, I had enough money to survive for six months without needing a job. And I really decided that before I was gonna go back headfirst into school, that I wanted to really take a, a, my best chance to qualify for a pro tour. And I played and played and played and I top aided a bunch of PTQs in a row. And I finally won one at the end of that season. And that was a pretty big springboard for me into, um, eventually getting to play on a pro tour. Uh, this was really the start of it though. And I felt like that format, there were so much intricacies to sequencing because the format had a lot, the temples provided man or provided uh, tap lands and then there were pain lands in the format, but the mana still wasn't the smoothest. Your opponent didn't always have the chance to play like their this format with three color cards didn't have the chance to play their curve as they wanted. And I remember in particular, the Abzan Jeskai matchup was really tricky because the Abzan deck, the Siege Rhino deck was more powerful, but had worse mana. And you could really get a lot of percentage points if you learned to sequence your things based on their mana. If they had, you know, if they had Bile Blight, it was gonna kill Rabble Master or Mantis Rider no matter what, but Ultimate Price couldn't kill Mantis Rider. So if they weren't showing Bile Blight, Mantis Rider meant you were gonna get three damage in. If they were showing Bile Blight, you'd rather them kill Rabble Master because Mantis Rider will get more damage in over the long run. So you like want, if you really learn to sequence your threats, you could push enough damage across to win those matches. And, and as I got good at that, the format really paid a lot of dividends and I made a lot of money um, to help me survive through not having a job at this point. I have so many bad beat stories, but this one, this one was painful in particular because it, happened, it comes against the Hall of Fame pro. I, I played against Huey. And at this point, it's, it's an SCG Invitational, and I'm doing really well up to this point. I, six, I went six and two day one, playing mono blue control in the standard portion, or mono blue aggro. This is Theros, um, Theros Ravnica standard. So I'm playing mono blue aggro in that format, and I'm doing really well. And then in Legacy, which I never play, I decided to play Esper Stoneblade. And Esper Stoneblade, you know, this is Deathrite Shaman, Stoneforge Mystic, Jace the Mind Sculptor. Um, you get Plow, Brainstorm, the works. Uh, I did not play any basic lands. And that was kind of unfortunate. So in this tournament up to this point, I believe I'm seven and two and I get paired against Huey, and he's on red, blue, sneak and show. And I have never played this matchup before. So game one, uh, I have force of will for his um, show and tell. He unfortunately has misdirection, counters my force of will, puts a, a grizzle brand into play, draws a bunch of cards, is able to make a, a sneak attack also, and I, I'm, I'm dead on the spot. And so I lose game one, and I'm like, I know he's really good, so this is gonna be an unfortunate match. So game two happens, and um, I play turn one death right shaman. He plays land, lotus petal, blood moon. And this is a nightmare for me. I have zero basic lands in my deck. There's nothing I could cast. By all accounts, I should just lose this game. And I, I'm not thinking about it enough to realize that I should just not play anything. 
but I don't. And instead I draw, play my like, basically, you know, my mountain, my underground sea and attack for one. Well, he draws and he doesn't have a land, so he passes. And I'm like, draw, play another land, attack for one. He draws, he plays a fetch land. So he still doesn't need blue. And I'm like, interesting. You know what? I think I'm actually just not supposed to play anything. So I draw, I don't play anything. I attack for one, I pass. He draws, plays another mountain. I draw, I don't attack and I discard the hand size because now my death right shaman's actually gonna make some mana here. And so I'm like, oh, I have access to something. So I EOT a Snapcaster Mage. I untap, attack for three, hold cards, discard to hand size, make another Snapcaster Mage. And he shortly concedes without ever finding a blue source. Uh, he's begun discarding hand size. So uh, I managed to steal a game that I'm like, wow, I had no business winning that game. So in game three, um, we get to a spot where I believe it's turn three. I have Jace the Mind Sculptor in hand. Um, I have Stoneforge Mystic and I'm going to tutor up Batter Skull and I think I'm really going to be able to turn the corner here. So turn three, I cast Thoughtseize and I remember he had just resolved Ponder. He left the cards on top of his deck. He has four cards in hand. So my Thoughtseize reveals Misty Rainforest, Lotus Petal, Brainstorm, Emrakul. So he doesn't have he doesn't have anything to put anything into play. And if I take the Emrakul, he won't have anything to put into play. So he needs to draw both halves of his combo to go off. Not to mention the Emrakul is also gonna shuffle away the Ponder. So this seems like a pretty straightforward decision. I take the Emrakul, we shuffle the Ponder. I play Stoneforge Mystic, I grab Batter Skull, I pass. He untaps, goes draw, play land, play Brainstorm, play Show and Tell, play Grizzle Brand. Draw, draw seven, discard to hand size, pass. I untap, I try to resolve Jace. He, force of wills, draws seven more cards, plays a blood moon, and I'm dead. And I just remember being like, man, he had to draw both pieces here, fresh off the thought seize. Basically that turn, otherwise the Jace resolves, and it becomes really difficult for him to ever win this game. And, and I did ask him afterwards, like, did I, did I take the right card? Should I have taken the Emrakul instead of the Brainstorm? And he said, yeah, he, had, he left a, a copy of Sneak Attack on top of his deck, so I was gonna lose either way. So that was a really tough bad beat, and, and it was foreshadowing as I ended up missing out on on top 16 and then eventually top 32 in this tournament for a thousand dollars because i lost to blood moon on turn one three more times over the course of the legacy rounds and that was a tough tournament i thought i played really well my favorite magic trip this is a little bit of an unfair question because the rest of the trips really can't compete with the fact that i never have gotten to travel out of the country before so winning a pp uh, winning an rptq for a trip to Pro Tour Kyoto for Hour of Devastation was really its own special experience. Um, my good friend Joel had actually uh, also had the ability to go with me. He bought a plane ticket and he tagged along even though he wasn't qualified for the event. So I got to travel around the world with one of my best friends and, and go play in this Pro Tour. And my, my first ever Pro Tour, I had never qualified before. And so this was kind of a lifelong dream meets the chance to you know, get a second life, you know, a, a once in a lifetime experience was really, really cool. Um, <clears throat> this tournament went really poorly for me. Uh, I remember the start of the tournament itself. They have you count your packs when they give you for your draft pod. They count it out. Uh, and in and, and the meantime, while you're counting the number of cards in your pack, the guy who's supposed to count down the time for your draft pick <clears throat> is catering to 400 people. And so, of course, I'm in the middle of this giant room. It's really quiet except for the guy who's speaking. Um, I'm counting out my first pack. My first pack only has 14 cards in it and it's supposed to have 15 cards. So I have to call a judge. Well, as I'm trying to get a judge's attention, I hear, you know, you may pick your first card and you have like 40 seconds to look through the whole pack and pick a card. And so I'm calling a judge over. I can't get anybody's attention. I'm trying to yell louder. Finally, a judge comes by. We're down to like 20 seconds. They replace my pack. By the time I have a chance to even look at it, I basically have enough time to like locate the rare. And I just pick the Hydra that's like a four mana, three, three, 
Yeah, believe it has vigilance and trample, and it gets plus one, plus one if you have a desert in play, and plus one, plus one if you have a desert in your graveyard. And I'm just like, well, I know I'm, I've never been the greatest drafter, and this is like a rough start to like how this tournament's going to go. Um, <clears throat> and so I end up losing, my, I build a pretty bad draft deck. I lose the first round. I'm 0-1 and, and get paired against Pro Tour champion Jeremy Dazani. And funny enough, I win that match. I lose the next one to an opponent who draws four blockers in a row at one life to, to manage to steal that match. I, I can't buy uh, a win anywhere. So I don't make day two. I go three and five. The, the tournament itself is, is largely forgettable, but there were some, some really phenomenal moments that weekend. Joel, uh, his favorite player is Guillaume Wafotapa, who was gracious enough to sign his mystical teachings. That was really cool. Um, we had these really expensive foiled out dual commander decks and we were sitting in the middle of the tournament hall and we would get spectators who come and watch and like what the heck are these guys doing and uh there were a couple of japanese players who came by and all of our cards are in english but obviously they know the artwork they know what's going on and my friend wins a counter war to resolve a jace and as soon as he resolves it i immediately untap and he's playing grixis with like four basic lands in his deck i cast ruination and as soon as i put ruination on the table it blows up all nine of his lands and the two japanese players look at each other and then they smirk and then they just walk off <laughs> they're just like oh what happened and, and they leave and uh you know little moments like that that were a lot of fun um joel got to they, they at pro tours they actually give you they will give out boxes if you can get eight people together they'll give you a box of unopened booster packs and let you go draft with with each other and uh joel got to draft with a group of professionals who who were looking for an eighth player and so that was a really cool experience for him we got to visit a zoo in japan we ate all kinds of great food um <clears throat> The flight, I actually ended up with a first-class ticket on the way back. I did not know that Wizards was nice enough get, to give me a first-class ticket. Uh, that, was, that was really cool. I got to be a part of Magic history. I at least got to witness it very up close and personal. The Magic Player of the Year race at this point is really between Marcio Carvalho and Paolo Vitor Domodorosa. And it's coming down to the point where Marcio has a large enough edge that he will win player of the year so long as Paolo doesn't win this tournament because Marcio has been eliminated before the top eight. Paolo's in the top eight. And in the semifinals, Paolo is playing the mono red mirror. Um, and I, I forget, I don't want to butcher the, the guy's name. I think his name was Yi, Wei Yam Chun, something along those lines. Uh, I, my apologies to him. Uh, he, they get to a spot where Paolo has his opponent basically dead on board. He's got like 80% of his deck is going to be lethal over the course of the next turn. <clears throat> I believe he's at four. Paolo is at like 11, I think. And his opponent needs to draw exactly a three damage burn spell to win this game. And he does. He draws Incendiary Flow on a board that has like Hazaret. He has two cards in hand. He has some lands. And Paolo had, I believe, attacked with his creature and has one blocker for Hazaret up. And in his excitement, the guy draws stands up in his seat almost like comes at like you know is like super excited the crowd goes nuts the crowds it's like waiting rooting on him and i'm sitting behind marcio carvalho who like throws his hands in the air because this is the card that wins the match and eliminates pv that is player of the year for him and in his excitement he goes to attackers and tries to attack with hazaret but with, only, with two cards in hand, you can't attack. But since he's no longer in his main phase, he can't cast Incendiary Flow because it's a sorcery. So he like realizes the mistake he made, basically knocks his own headset off, which can't come off, and they have to reset him, and they have to like try to calm him back to zero. He makes the correct play and kills both of Paolo's creatures with his two burn spells, attacks with Hazaret, but Paolo has like ramming up ruins and draws like a two damage burn spell and finishes, on, finishes him off with the desert and, and ends up winning the match. And the guy is just, he's just shattered. And I'm sitting in front of Marcio, and as they rule that the guy can't attack for lethal anymore, he just puts his hands over his head, and he just walks out of the hall. And and I remember it's a that is a very very famous moment in Magic to see, like the the elation 
and then the just the depression in the room for the people who were really rooting against Paolo or for his opponent and and that was pretty cool to see like up close and personal after the pro tour at the end of that sunday we concluded our trip with a dinner uh, we walked everywhere while we were in japan so joel and i we wandered over to um this restaurant and we really have no idea where we're going or what we're looking for we're just you know whatever catches our eye and so we walk in um, part of this part of the downtown area and we walk up a set of stairs and there's this restaurant and they, they walk us in and they seat us into this kind of like like recessed seating area where you you sit down you take off your shoes and you sit almost like cross-legged in this little this little table that can't be more than like chest high once you once you get down into the into the seats and so we sit down and, and it's just the two of us but we're very close quarters with a small walkway in where you know two sets of of table or the second table sits and joel and i are waiting for our food and we hear the group of guys next to us are uh they're speaking english but they have european accents i i believe that it, it sounds dutch you know maybe they're probably not all from the same area and i hear one of the guys and he says something along the lines of like i'm so bad at this game and he made like he let his opponent like bring something out of the graveyard while he has an active knight of the reliquary in play and is like i'm supposed to get bajuka bog but i'm so bad at this game and instead i get wasteland and then he wastelands me and then i can't cast anything and he's like and then i just end up losing and uh and as i'm you know as i'm listening to them one of the guys starts talking about the whole marcio carvalho losing player of the year thing and I'm, I can't help but interject. It's just, you know, I, I was there. I have to talk about it. And so I, I interject. I'm like, hey, you know, I, you guys, we, I, I'm sure I've ran into you guys at the Pro Tour this weekend, like, you know, and we start swapping some stories and, and talking about that particular incident. One of the guys goes on to talk about how, you know, also he says he's really bad at the game. And apparently he played in one of the Mox online championship things and he starts 0-2. And then he ends up winning every round the rest of the, the rest of the way, wins the tournament, and next thing you know, he's like platinum for the next five pro tours and is just like, I have no idea how I lucked my way into that. But I'm sitting at this table, you know, with four guys from four separate parts of Europe and they're all friends and and how the world of like magic has literally brought the world together in this moment that, you know, we couldn't spin a globe and find where each other lives on it but we're all happen chance sitting at the same group of tables talking about this this game that we love and and i think that was a really special part of my favorite trip as well that was a lot of fun and and wherever those guys are you know i hope that's something that that meant something similar to them i equate so much of magic with a lot of my growing up i i didn't play the game the same religion i was more of a sport kid through my teenage years and and my parents really wanted me to focus on school and and my dad got to the point that he really didn't like magic i i was the kind of person i was a little obsessive i i loved to fiddle with cards and sort them and and goldfish a deck and and i i really it would it would take a lot of my time and and he didn't like it very much and he really didn't like it as i got closer to being adult age and needing to you know fulfill my responsibilities it seemed like a place where it was just distracting from really getting a degree or getting a, a good job or what have you but through my 20s i played so much magic and i got to do so much traveling i met so many friends i got jobs because of it um i had uh, various opportunities i've had uh, so many of my friends even to this day so many of my best friends this interview right now are because of magic itself and and the amount of time that i've invested in the relationships that i've been able to to build through it uh and and honestly i think it's irreplaceable i i heard recently listening to a podcast you know they, they asked what why is magic so special and and why is like the tournament scene so special and and i really can't help but echo the thought that there's no other place where the vast majority of us would be in the top percentile of the world at what we do that we could be on the same golf course as tiger woods or we could be out at the the batting cages with you know mike trout like here we are playing magic in the same room as hall of fame magic players and i've played and i've won and i've lost against these same guys and, and you know i've got and have conversations with them and and it's it's really something that you can't replace and and that um there's a there's a pride in being that close to 
I guess, greatness even um, that, that you hold on to. And so I really hope for the future of Magic that they, that they find a way, whether it's going back to the PPTQ, RPTQ system or, or revamping how they do Pro Tours, but that they bring back the ability to still gather the world together and have you play matches against people who don't speak the same language as you, but you speak magic together. You do know what's going on. And, and you know, to be able to literally play the game and see the world. And uh, that I think is what magic has meant to me a lot, just in the, in the amount of time that I've gotten to do it, being able to, cha to, to really chase a dream that is aspirational, but attainable for a fair number of people. Um, and, and I hope that that it continues. I hope that Wizards, wh whatever that they decide, whatever they come up with, that they they wheel back around to organized play being something that is a mainstay of the game and holds us all together.